name is uh, Jeremy McCullough. I work at MongoDB. This talk has nothing to do with MongoDB. Um, but if, uh, hopefully you can buy a set of my board or booth down there. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit today about um, wearing your branding for it. Uh, HHBM and Hack, which is uh, two projects from Facebook. Uh, the first is basically an alternative PHP runtime. And the second is an alternative way of writing PHP, basically. Um, so this talk is going to be an overview of um, just, uh, I guess, before we even start, how many people have, are familiar with either of these or have heard of them? Okay. Um, how many people actually write hack code at, at work or have a chance to do that? Okay, cool. Uh, so that the majority of it is going to be exploring some of what hack syntax is because it's, it's probably more relevant to us. So like HHVM is kind of a put some effort in to get it up and running and then it should theoretically just run all your PHP code, so it's not too exciting. Can't fill up 15 minutes on that. Uh, but I'll throw the slides out later. Uh, there's a bunch of things that I link to in here. Uh, this is if you want to grab me on Twitter for any uh, questions or anything, find me later. Uh, additionally, if you are curious about this, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, if you want to wake up at 9 a.m., uh, but I kind of have to, uh, I'll have a three hour, two three hour workshops over the course of the day. So the, the one from 9 to, I guess, noon uh, is an introduction, and then the afternoon uh, kind of builds on that. And uh, but still a separate workshop to go over uh, data modeling and schema design. So if you're curious about that, uh, that'll be my only pitch for, uh, for those guys. All right, uh, so we'll take it from the top and just a take a history about um, where HHVM and Hack came from. Uh, and so something that a lot of people immediately that comes to mind and they get confused over this is they think uh, they hear HHVM and they think, isn't that that project that Facebook made that turns PHP into C++ code? Uh, and so that was actually uh, originally just called Hip Hop, the Hip Hop compiler. This is all the way back in 2008, uh, before MongoDB existed. And the that project was basically their first, um, uh, the first thing they, that Facebook was reaching. They realized that they had all this PHP code that they desperately needed to get more performance out of. And so the easiest win was to, I don't say easiest, but uh, the most direct path of least resistance was let's convert this into something we know is a lot faster to the C++ code that we compile. Uh, and so that was this tool uh, called just hip hop or HPHBC for uh, compiler. And it basically turned the PHP, parsed it into a syntax tree, and did some transformations to turn it into C code. Uh, and then they just compiled that to uh, regular machine code. Uh, and so their uh, deployments were basically just compiled C applications. Uh, so that was great and dandy, but it wasn't nearly as flexible as with HHM today. What I just mentioned in the instruction is the goal is you can just drop it in and run all your PHP code. Uh, so this was nowhere near that uh, that level of flexibility. It was kind of a subset of what they, what PHP syntax could work with. Uh, there were two developer tools at the time. The first um, interpreter was kind of so the compiling process is obvious. That's more of a you're actually compiling code and releasing binaries. Uh, so when you're you were developing with this, you needed a, a live interpreter uh, that was actually just a separate tool uh, that the, the Facebook employees would use, and then likewise a debugger to be able to debug the uh, the online app. Um, or the C++ binaries to be able to know what PHP code uh, is actually running. Uh, so that was 2008, and moving a bit forward, uh, there's this gap in 2009, but in 2010, uh, they open sourced uh, that compiler um, to let other people start playing with it, so previously they had just something they had talked about. And uh, that's also when they start, started working on uh, HHVM. And the goal of HHVM was um, the HH, again, standing for hip-hop, uh, just like the name of the compiler, but uh, VM for a virtual machine being uh, a full uh, live environment, a full alternative PHP runtime. The, the goal was to be able to run any uh, PHP code that normal PHP interpreter could run from Zen. Uh, and so in this goal, the, the graph looks a little bit different. We're going from PHP code, again, parsing it into uh, syntax tree, uh, and then they wanted to go to just to bytecode that they could run. So instead of just cutting out all the C++ compilation. Uh, and so this would be kind of similar to how uh, PHP itself works when you, when you run the Zen's PHP um, and maybe with APC for caching and stuff, you, your PHP code gets turned into bytecode, and that's your, your bytecode cache uh, for PHP. So your, your PHP files don't have to be interpreted on every request. Uh, but additionally, they ended up extending this. They said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll end up with this bytecode, and we, can, we still want to get more performance out of that, so we'll use a just-in-time compiler uh, and be able to turn the bytecode in, into machine code. And so this was the, the vision of um, to, to go forward with HHVM was basically instead of creating these monolithic C++ binaries, which would be harder to debug and everything, let's make a, a single VM environment uh, with a JIT compiler uh, that would be able to, to run our bytecode through, through a JIT and uh, optimize it for machine code. 
Uh, and so it was a year later that Facebook then said the same thing they eventually, that they previously did with the hip hop compiler was they took HHVM and they threw it out on GitHub, uh, invited other people to play with it to uh, contribute to it. And it was also this time that uh, in, inside the company, HHVM was mature enough uh, when they open sourced it also to replace the hip hop compiler internally. Uh, so still, they were still using the, the, the thing that they originally developed in 2008 uh, until uh, 2011. So this is when they started eating their own dog food uh, officially. Uh, so this carried on around 2012. Um, so this was, the yellow graph is basically the HH fan performance. And uh, the hip hop compiler kind of stayed constant. They weren't investing new resources into that. Uh, but around 2012, they reached a point where the uh, enough effort had been uh, put into HH fan where the performance started to eclipse. Uh, their, uh, their C++ compiler, basically. Uh, and so that was, um, it had already been open source for a little bit of time by then, uh, and this is where development traction inside the company really came up, and it allowed them to, gave them more of a selling point internally to use HHVM. Uh, in 2013, uh, there's, there's two more of these timeline slides. Uh, so HHVM then officially replaced their compiler in, in their production deployments. Um, they added support, and this is more specifically because it's because it's being open source and they want it adopted by the community. Uh, support for fast CGI, which is basically what if you use PHP FPM, that same interface. Uh, so uh, 2.3 currently we're at 3.7, so this is quite a few versions ago. Uh, but this is if anyone uses Travis CI for testing, um, there is also a movement saying we will do all these open source PHP projects out there. We'd like those to also work with HHVM. A lot of them are already testing on Travis CI with their, every time they commit to get up, they run their unit tests. Uh, so they added HHVM, uh, they helped the Travis guys add that as a, as a runtime. So you can test your, um, any product that's on Travis, just have it run against HHVM as well. Uh, and they started doing these things called uh, performance and parity lockdown. So the uh, performance was basically to make sure that these growth spurts keep continuing. Uh, so as the Facebook developers would, uh, they talk about it on their blog, they basically lock themselves up in a room for two weeks and grow beards. Uh, and try to knock out as many uh, issues as possible and get as many gains and performance improvements as possible. And the right side of this parity is basically uh, that since their, their main goal is to maintain complete compatibility with your existing PHP code and whatever, however Zen executes your PHP code, they want to do the same. Uh, so the parity lockdowns were hunting down the issues that where they had probably the, maybe the test cases inside popular PHP frameworks were failing, uh, which meant that HHVM was subtly running the PHP code a bit differently than Zen. Uh, so we obviously can't have that, so in, uh, just as they're trying to increase performance, they also want to make sure that they're getting as close as parity to, so they're indistinguishable from any other PHP runtime. And the, these lockdowns are, uh, resulted in pretty amazing gains. They would, um, in one of them, they went from 90% of uh, popular GitHub projects having 100% test coverage to 98% of them. Uh, and using frameworks like Laravel and Symfony, um, uh, not doctrine because they, they do some dirty things with PHP code that HHVM hasn't gotten up to snuff yet. Uh, but uh, things like WordPress and Drupal, those are like the big projects they, they were targeting for um, parity performance. Uh, and a year later, uh, so this is uh, kind of where I came where I got this t-shirt. Uh, Facebook open sourced hack language last April. Uh, they invited um, about 100 or 150 developers out to their office in Palo Alto for um, kind of, they called it a hack developer day, and they, uh, it was like a full day full of talks from uh, Facebook employees and then some partners over uh, where they introduced hack, um, and they basically they made a new release of HHVM, which was 3.0, and then you could all of a sudden start using hack, which was basically PHP++, this PHP with extra syntax wrapped around it. Uh, and then also later in the year, they released 3.3, uh, which was their first, they decided that would be a long-term release. Uh, so this was important for any production company that wanted to use HHVM in production. Uh, so it was guaranteed that uh, if you're using this 3.3, um, the, the functionality and the security fixes and everything will just remain constant, similar to like an Ubuntu LTS. Uh, and so the next one actually came out uh, the year after. Um, it's uh, 3.6, and so you're kind of guaranteed that they're going to support that for at least a year, uh, or I believe it's about 12 months. Uh, until the next LPS comes out. Uh, and the, the main goal here was also just tracking PHP head. So this was around the time in the, in the last year where everyone's moving towards PHP 7. Uh, when I was at Open West last year, Davey Shefik was in the same room giving an overview of what's coming in PHP 7. Uh, and so the Facebook, since they're trying to maintain parity and PHP itself is a moving target, uh, they're very much so have to track all the progress that's happening in PHP core. Uh, so that's another thing that's uh, picking up steam here. And this brings us to this year. 
so 3.6 most recently came out, and that is the uh, most recent LTS release. Uh, they also, with uh, since hack is kind of an add-on to PHP syntax, it's, you can't run hack code inside PHP, uh, inside the Zen PHP interpreter. Uh, so Facebook released a tool called the Transpiler. It basically takes your hack code and generates um, more, a little bit more verbose PHP code for it. So it drops so some of the things that we'll see that hack adds later are things like type pinning. Um, instead of just using arrays for everything, they have like collection classes and vector classes and things like that. Uh, so the Transpiler lets you write a project in hack and if you'd like to deploy it, um, or maybe you're running an open source framework and you'd like to uh, take advantage of everything hack offers but then still, be, still support PHP users so you can in a build process, kind of run it through a transpiler and get a PHP version of your hack project. Uh, and it kind of dumps, you certainly lose all the benefits in the type typing, but it lets you run your hack project on a uh, on Zen PHP interpreter. Uh, so that's a pretty neat tool. Uh, something I know uh, when I went to the event last year, uh, Fabian from Symphony uh, Framework was asking about that because he was interested in having Symphony support both hack and PHP long term. Um, so I'm sure that was one of the questions that led them to uh, consider making such a tool. Uh, and where we stand currently, there's uh, of the 26 popular frameworks, and using the term loosely, uh, frameworks being some small libraries like Ascetic and Monolog, and then the actual frameworks like uh, Symphony Zen Framework 2 and um, Code Ignite or things like that. Uh, so there's 26 of those, and this is all tracked on HHM's website, but 26 where their test suites are at 100%. Uh, so that by no means means that HHVM's at 100% because the test suites aren't covering everything. Uh, but it's a, a good benchmark measure of how things are progressing, how they're reaching parity. Uh, and so this brings us, any questions about the timeline? I'm just gonna move into how, what HH, describe HHVM's architecture and how it runs code. Yeah, okay. yeah but there's any questions during the line, just uh, book your hand up and uh, we can get into that. And uh, I definitely stop me if I'm uh, moving too fast. I've been uh, waiting for two days to present. <laughs> Uh, so the one question here is, it's uh, 2015 and why are we still using PHP? And um, uh, two blog posts uh, that are relevant, uh, maybe you've seen these before, is one is called the Fractal of Bad Design, uh, which was uh, kind of complaining about all the bad things about PHP. Uh, and that's kind of written by someone outside the community. Uh, and then uh, PHP Sadness is written by someone inside the community. Um, is, uh, I think it's, his name is Eric Watzel. Uh, uh, but that, he basically just, it tracks uh, common, he basically has a open issue reports of these are things in PHP that are just really weird behaviors or things that I wish it didn't do. Uh, didn't do. Uh, and so this uh, is a fun website because he goes back and the author updates it regularly as new versions of PHP come out and the old sadness issues disappear because they've resolved things, they fixed uh, fixed issues. Um, uh, but generally PHP has been often been compared to this double-ended hammer. Uh, where it's not the most eloquent tool, even though you can still use it uh, as a hammer, and it still gets nails out. Uh, but it's by no means the the sexiest of programming languages, or the the nicest to work with. Uh, but that said, it's impossible to ignore that it's, uh, and this is maybe not geared to us as PHP developers, but uh, to anyone in the audience that maybe is not using uh, PHP. Uh, certainly a reason that Facebook decided to uh, uh, work with it and optimize it with Hack is they uh, if we consider trying to scientifically present these, but uh, they have a ridiculous amount of PHP code uh, over the number of years that they've uh, been a project. And so for them to decide that let's make a PHP to C++ compiler or let's make a virtual machine instead of rewriting our, our existing code into another language uh, is huge. And, uh, having our employees learn a new language uh, is a huge um, vote of confidence, perhaps. And uh, investing in PHP and saying that there, there's ways we can make PHP perform better. It's not uh, we can work around the, the pitfalls of it. It's certainly not an enemy of success. Um, for uh, the Wikimedia Foundation is one of the huge um, benchmarks that uh, Facebook uses for hacks. So in the last couple of years, uh, Wikipedia moved over to running on HHVM instead of Zen's uh, PHP server. And uh, well, every one of those transitions, uh, Etsy has had another one in the last. Uh, year where they've had the, they've done like a, a blog report or a war report on the over the last year their migration story and the performance gains they were able to see out of it. Uh, and so there's uh, despite the the language having its quirks, it's not an, and it doesn't mean you can't build something uh, truly outstanding for it. Uh, and perhaps a lot of us are familiar with uh, both WordPress and Drupal kind of being the ubiquitous uh, X percentage of websites on the internet happen to be running Drupal or WordPress or, or something like that. When there's a vulnerability in one of them. Mm -hmm. Takes down a fair chunk of uh, makes a fair chunk of the internet vulnerable because they're so widespread. 
Uh, and that said, as a developer, some of the things that we might like out of PHP, um, <coughs> working with it, um, what am I, I'm not particularly proud of this, but uh, maybe you can identify with this, but when you're debugging and you just wanted to put in a bar dump and uh, reload the page and see what something is instead of starting up the debugger and, and stepping into the code. Uh, so the, the, just the way PHP executes has this great feedback loop where we can change some code in an editor, go refresh our browser, and immediately see the results. Uh, and that was something that they, um, uh, last year when Facebook had their developer day, they were talking about that, some of the hack tools. They said our, our developers writing hack code, we want to make sure in their, their IDs that they're using in our hack debugger that they can just edit their hack code and <coughs> refresh in their development environments and immediately see the results. Uh, and that's why when they, even when they had that um, hip hop C++ compiler, they had that the interactive uh, mode in the debugger because they, they recognize that the uh, PHP developer doesn't want to have to compile their code and then look at the build results later. You'd like to be able to just interpret, reinterpret the code and see the results immediately. Uh, and with state, um, more in terms of just writing an application, uh, every, basically every web request that comes in has no state. Um, there's no, uh, unless you're deciding to use something funny in PHP like pthreads or some of those other forking in the background, there's really no concurrency to speak of. PHP is single threaded, so there's there's none of the uh, mentally you don't have to track locks and all these these additional things. Uh, so it's very easy if you're um, to simplify the, the code that you're writing, knowing that uh, there's one entry point, there's one control flow through this program uh, through my web controller, uh, and every request is a blank slate. I don't have to think about um, previous state from other requests. So I'm not when I'm writing PHP, I'm writing the thing that hand, that answers the request. I'm not it's not like a Java application where I, I am the app server. Uh, and so those are some things that um, are just intrinsic to PHP's design uh, and something I personally enjoy uh, working with PHP uh, for those. And um, a kind of a defensive article to the, the previous two on the, the slide I had earlier was the inverse of the fractal bad design was uh, Keith Adams from Facebook and you can dig up the article link later from the slides. Uh, but he wrote a kind of a defensive blog post of why Facebook takes PHP seriously. This was uh, from a presentation at Strange Loop Conference. Uh, mostly to an audience of non-PHP uh, developers. Uh, and so this brings us, uh, carrying in with uh, kind of the state of each request and concurrency. Uh, so look, I just want to explore when we're, if you're running HHVM, what is the, how does a request look like um, running through HHVM? And I'll, is there any markers in the room? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to use wild hand motions, but in PHP itself, um, is everyone familiar basically with how FPM handles a request? Or, or rather, is anyone, let's just go through it. Anyway. Uh, so with FPM or, or Apache, you have these, you have workers, and so your web server comes in and it has, oh, it's very healthy. That's the dexterity portion of the, of the top. <laughs> Uh, so th this is something I've become int intimately familiar with, uh, not going to be writing the PHP driver because we do persistent connections in between these things. Uh, and so let's say we have uh, Nginx as your absolute web server, and then that talks to FPM. And then we have a bunch of these workers. And basically your web requests are coming in whether this is Nginx or, um, or Apache, and communicating over this fast CGI protocol, uh, which is, again, something that HHVM is going to support. And FPM is probably the more popular today over um, uh, mod PHP and Apache. Uh, but FPM is a fast CGI server for PHP, and so it is uh, basically your PHP app server. So every time an Nginx request comes in and realizes, oh, I need to process this, I need to execute this PHP file, it will go ask FPM to run it. And internally, FPM is just uh, listening on a local socket to talk to the, your web server. And it's going to maintain this pool of workers. And each of these workers will be their own uh, actual process on your, on your operating system. And they're responsible for uh, PHP. Basically, I'm given this PHP script, and I'm going to go resolve it. Uh, and so these workers, over their lifetime, may serve anywhere. If, if you want to be inefficient, you could have a worker serve one PHP request and then die. Uh, but most likely, you'll have a worker stick around and say, oh, well, I'll serve 500 PHP requests. And in case I'm concerned about memory leaks, uh, then I'll let myself be recycled. Uh, but FPM will, will allow you to scale up this pool of workers uh, as, as large as your, your app server uh, will maintain. And each one of these is, uh, again, going to be a single-threaded uh, runtime in PHP. 
And after it dies, it certainly just drops everything and it's, it has no persistence after that. Uh, so if you're writing, if you're using like a MySQL driver or another database driver, uh, each worker can remember itself, uh, can remember any open sockets that it needs. Uh, and additionally, um, the bytecode, um, if we're caching the PHP results, we might not even have to use the workers, or we might not have to use the, the aspect of that's parsing our PHP code. So the, uh, the workers are doing the heavy lifting here. And so HHVM is basically, since it implements fast CGI, it's basically uh, this uh, bubble here. So you're still putting a web server in front of it. Uh, and so this, um, the, the base case of HHVM is uh, the bytecode interpreter. So we have this PHP script and we need to turn it into uh, bytecode to be executed. And so this applies both to HHVM and uh, PHP in general. Uh, and so as this comes in, uh, in any production environment you would be using, um, you would want to cache your, your PHP files in this bytecode. Uh, we basically check if the PHP file on disk has been modified. And if it hasn't, um, we expect that that means we ran it before. Um, so we have the old bytecode for it and it hasn't changed. Uh, so we'll just go and execute it. And the, the bytecode here are basically the PHP uh, instructions, the outcodes. Uh, but if the file has been modified, and so this kind of requires checking, doing a little stat on the file on disk, um, then we have to invalidate the bytecode cache and then recompile the, the PHP file to bytecode. Uh, and then hopefully on the next request, we can just keep jumping on uh, the no branch here. So that's what we'd like to do. Uh, and so this is what HHVM, HHVM is going to do, this is what APC and what Zen opcache do, uh, this kind of basic flowchart. And your disk cache could be anything from uh, SQLite, you could be caching bytecode on files, uh, that's not too important. Uh, but if we're running something in interpreter mode, uh, or if you're running PHP from the CLI environment, uh, you'll probably, in, in that case, you're, you're not using any bytecode caching at all, you're always just reevaluating your PHP script on the end. Uh, but HHVM will take this and it wants to extend it because bytecode is good, but if we're we're doing a just-in-time compiler, we want to actually convert that bytecode to machine code and optimize it. Uh, and so we extend this, uh, the, this is basically the original chart, we, so we kind of blew up the, we're, we're going to add a bunch of stuff there. Uh, so the request comes in and we check if it's, if it's been modified, if it has, yes, we have to go compile bytecode. Uh, but then once we decide if we, uh, if it's not been modified, it means we have some bytecode already, and we'll check if it's been compiled into native machine code to basically assembly instructions. And if it hasn't, then we can just go and execute it. And that's going to be a lot faster than executing uh, regular bytecode. Uh, but if we have it, we'll, we're going to check if it's a hot path in our code. So one of the things HHVM is going to do in, in the JIT compiler is not going to, it's not going to bother converting all of your PHP code into uh, native machine code. It's going to uh, kind of like watch your application and decide these are the, the parts of your code, this is the parts of your application that are running very frequently. Uh, so if you're using a web framework, then it's, it's obviously going to be maybe the whole HTTP kernel and the, the, everything that builds the request objects and launches your controllers. And it might not be the service that you, don't, that you regularly use. Uh, but you basically trust that HHVM is going to identify what's the code that gets called a lot, we really want to optimize that. We'll make sure that that exists as native code. And the uh, last note here is when you're deploying an application, um, like if I'm doing a release to production, uh, this, the source on the uh, production web server is not going to change. I've made my release, uh, so I should be able to pre-compile the bytecode as part of my release process. Uh, so if you're doing that, H, one of HHVM's mode, as this is something, an option you would use in, um, on your production HHVM versus your uh, local development environment, uh, would be, it's called repo authoritative. Repo just, in this case, means your bytecode cache. Uh, so it's saying we're just always going to trust that our bytecode cache has the correct file. So we, we no longer have to check on disk, uh, sorry, disk and see if our .php file has, or .hack file has changed. Uh, so this basically cuts out uh, the whole um, checking disk branch and uh, compiling bytecode. Uh, so in a release process, we'll always generate that and we'll still allow the JIT compiler over the course of our application. Uh, if the source code remains the same, the bytecode is, again, as a one-to-one -one relationship, that stays the same. Uh, but the hot paths are basically what change. So over the course of our application, based on maybe usage or the kind of web requests that come in, Maybe if we're an API-driven site, different uh, parts of the API might get used on different days. Uh, so the, the paths that are hot in our application, even given the same source code, might change. So the, the JIT compiler is still going to keep an eye on that and make sure that most of the code is kept optimized that needs to run most frequently. Uh, so those are the three, basically, control workflows uh, for each other. Any question about how these three work? Yeah. Is there any way, I mean, that's, that's very cool, first off. Is the chart no, reasonably easy to do? No, 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 absolutely. But I spent a lot of time in Google Slides. But no, no, that's great. Is there a way, I mean, this makes me, I'm going to take it one step further. Is there a way to just say, 
uh, everything on the repo should be compiled native, not not even not just the hot path. Uh, so the question is uh, for the recording: Is there a way to even make everything be compiled native in a hot path? Uh, and for that, to my knowledge, there is not, and uh, that is because the hot path depends on the the flow through the code. So even in terms of when your if branches, um, what are the, what is the likelihood that you're because the, the code itself is dynamic. Uh, so even though we have static typing, the, the flow through the code is dynamic. So the hot path is optimizing for the the flow through. It might do things like branch prediction. Uh, like okay, I was, just, I was just thinking it was like at a file level, but I, I oh no, yeah, this is definitely at an application. I see what you're a, yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, this is definitely something that you want. Um, the main goal of Repo Authoritative is we get rid of all the, the disk I/O of continually static files. And um, in a production deploy, yeah, the, the native code will still can or it likely will still change uh, the, the shape of the path through the code will still change. Uh, so that's why we don't want to eliminate this and, and just execute it. Because that kind of takes us back to the H, um, the hip hop C++ compiler, where we, we're just left with this native code. And the ideally, the um, the fact that HHVM can eclipse the performance is because it's able to uh, recognize the hot paths and, and re recompile things to the native code. So even though, I guess, uh, hypothetically, the, the same code might result in different native code depending on how, how it gets utilized. The same page, your, your application might result in different native code for different parts of the, the application when they're compiled on successive times. Uh, and so if you're doing this repo authoritative, you'll want to generate the bytecode in advance. Uh, this is a just a snippet of how you might do that as part of your deploy process. Uh, so this is benchmarking, and uh, uh, forgive me that I've I haven't gone and uh, pulled up, um, I guess the most recent benchmarking might be Etsy's article. Uh, so this is actually using the older HHVM version, uh, but it was the most prepared um, uh, graphs and comparisons. Uh, and so this was actually written by some folks, if you're a Symphony developer, you might have heard of the company uh, Leap, L-I-I-P, from Switzerland. Uh, they they uh, work on a number of bundles in the Symphony community. Uh, and so they were uh, very early, in, uh, before Hack was available, were benchmarking HHVM against PHP 5.5 and 5.3. Uh, with their Symphony app, and their app uh, was very useful in this in that they were doing a lot of um, actual CPU bounded uh, stuff where they're serializing large bits of JSON on the PHP. Uh, so it wasn't a, a typical data, a typical app where you're querying the database uh, and, and shuffling strings around. Uh, so this is definitely a, a use where you can see that some actual CPU optimization could actually help us. Uh, and so they were benchmarking against using Nginx uh, with fast CGI, and then they used the Apache Bench to actually uh, simulate the load. Uh, and so the actual results, uh, Christian Stocker, if you'd like to look this up later, uh, although I would probably recommend uh, Etsy's recent uh, blog posts and presentations on this. Uh, but in their small responses, uh, in this case, um, the, the more striking thing here is just basically how bad PHP 5.3 was compared to, to 5.5. And uh, certainly with 5.6, things have gotten uh, a lot better if you're following the, the just the Zen core PHP benchmarks. Uh, what we see really the HHVM increase uh, became much better at a uh, much higher load. Uh, so in this case, yellow is HHVM. And so at uh, higher load, in this case, the, just comparing the response times request per second. So when there's moderately small traffic, really the, the gains are not as visible. But in um, just high traffic websites is again another reason why, excuse me, the Wikipedia Foundation saw excellent results moving to HHVM is because they're kind of exclusively hanging out in this high end of the spectrum. And in that kind of uh, high traffic environment, HHVM just performs a lot, uh, a lot better than 5.3 and 5.5. Uh, and then in uh, larger responses, really it just uh, magnifies again. Um, 5.3 just quickly uh, trails off, and uh, HHVM. And this, sorry, this the diagram here. Uh, it's quite comparable. It's basically the double the performance of 5.5 in this for the for the response times and the the ability to, to scale with requests. Uh, and for the largest, um, it even performs a little better. So this is where you're kind of pushing even more limits on, on PHP itself. Uh, so it's kind of hovering around double the performance of uh, what you can get out of PHP 5 at the time. And uh, the, to kind of summarize all this in some nice conclusions here, uh, PHP 5.5 was definitely a lot better than uh, 5.3. And so this was uh, in early 2004. It was at a time where we're still trying to get people off of 5.3. Uh, which is now officially unsupported. Um, and HHVM at the time, and their best benchmarks were multiple times faster than 5.3. Uh, 
Uh, maybe about twice as fast as 5.5. And um, now, like 5.6 even had more games over 5.5. So the, the window for, uh, I guess, unless we're running in incredibly high performance sites, is probably not huge for us. So if, if you're going to HHPM, you might double your performance over PHP 5.6. Uh, so weigh, consider that when you're weighing if uh, if it's worth changing that much of your uh, kind of replacing your web server your or, uh, PHP FPM with HHPM. Uh, that's that said, if you're anticipating a lot of high load, that's really where HHPM starts to shine. Uh, and then certainly, if, uh, as we get into the second half of this presentation, looking at what hack offers, if you'd like to use some of that syntax, then obviously that's another excuse to, to consider using HHPM. Uh, the best conclusion here, uh, universally and unequivocally, would be to stop using PHP 5.3. Uh, and at this point, I would say also probably stop using 5.4 because the uh, PHP core has gotten a lot uh, more stringent on their support cycles. Uh, so 5.3 is well past, even though if we look at, take a survey of the frameworks or things on, pa on the packages or composer of uh, popular libraries that support stuff, a lot of people are still, will require 5.3 syntax and above, and that's really just because a lot of libraries just care about using namespaces and things. Uh, but as far as the PHP internal community, uh, in another few months, 5.4 won't even be getting security updates. Uh, so you really should be um, on a more aggressive uh, update schedule if you're, if you're, even if you're just sticking with PHP. Uh, so that said, uh, what really shined here and some of the reason that why the HH perform HHVM performance was a lot better is because in uh, Christian's benchmark he was doing a lot of CPU bound uh, with, the, with the serialization of going from JSON to PHP serialization. Uh, and so that's really where the, the native JIT compilation really helps there because we're getting better execution speed. Uh, but in a lot of web applications where we're waiting on uh, I.O. or uh, we're just shuffling strings around, the, the benefits of uh, just-in-time compilation really don't, aren't going to be as, <coughs> as uh, impressive. Uh, and that's because the I.O. is usually the slowest part of our, of our web applications. Uh, so a quick look at installing HHVM if you're, as far as what it supports. Uh, generally, since this is, uh, it's not a, uh, it's not anywhere near as meant to be as ubiquitous as PHP itself, so they, they don't target Windows development. Um, they had some uh, folks contributing to it with a goal of it. Uh, but it's basically, if, if you're using this, you should be running it on Linux. Uh, with Mac, it runs in interpreter mode. There's no JIT compiler, so it's good for development. Um, likewise for uh, Facebook's employees, but in a production environment, you're going to be want to, uh, you're, you'll want to use 64-bit Linux for this. And since it is, um, it's quite more intensive to compile from source than PHP itself, uh, like most C++ applications. Uh, so Linux binaries are available uh, um, from Facebook themselves for Ubuntu and Debian, and then the community supported ones for various other distributions. Uh, if you're building from source, um, it's going to take a while. Uh, there are a fair amount of dependencies. This is all thankfully documented on uh, their GitHub wiki, um, so you can check that out if you're interested. Uh, in my case, when I was playing with HHVM last year, around the time that I uh, first um, ended up creating the presentation, uh, we were uh, prototyping a Mongo driver for HHVM, which required extension development. Uh, so I had no choice but to uh, go through this and grab a Snickers. Uh, and it took quite a while. Uh, so if you're doing this, uh, it is, uh, uh, I cannot stress this enough, uh, the dash J option to take advantage of multiple CPU cores. I accidentally ran this without uh, dash J, and it uh, probably took about four times longer than it needed to. It reminded me of using Gentoo back in the early 2000s. Uh, so, any questions about HHVM itself? Uh, it's kind of a dry subject. Hopefully, this is hack would be a lot more exciting. This would be like seeing so all this. So, uh, sorry, I came in a little late, but it's oh, yeah. is it a? So you're saying HHVM is? There's no modification to the existing PHP code. It just runs. The goal, if, if all works well, is that you can take your existing PHP code and run it through HHVM, either the command line version or it's the web server equivalent, uh, whichever SACI you prefer, and it should give you the same results as PHP. Um, I guess one of the things that has, uh, talk about this towards well, a little towards the end, uh, but I'll jump to it. Um, Facebook started creating a, you might have heard about it, a PHP language specification. Uh, and so it's started by some employees in Facebook and they kind of uh, invested the resources to create a language spec similar to what like Python has and, and things like that. Uh, just to de define all the intricacies of how to, how, like, how to write a PHP parser. Things that uh, were just taken as like private internal knowledge for PHP internals uh, folks. And document like these are the core PHP functions, how operators work and things like that. Uh, and they publish this as a community document and then turn it over to the PHP community and hopefully we'll maintain this. 
Uh, and so going forward, um, obviously Facebook had the difficult task of trying to mimic what PHP does just by running weird code on it and trying to mimic the same results. So they really copied it even down to some of its quirks and faults in uh, PHP 5.6. Uh, so some things on like the PHP Sadness website uh, where Eric Watson would say, I hate this part about PHP, but it is, that's how someone out there may be depending on PHP to run the code that way. So HHVM had to maintain that uh, the parity. So they had to make um, HHVM just as quirky. Yes, at least for running PHP code. Now when, H when uh, Hack comes in, we can throw that out the window, and with Hack syntax, we can say we're not gonna support these quirks anymore uh, because it is a, technically a different language, uh, even though it looks and feels very much like PHP. All right, but it sounds like to me that you I could use HHVM as a drop-in replacement, as a drop -in replacement yeah. and yep. nothing would really change. Correct. Let's use it. Yeah. And so the, uh, on HHVM's blog, they do have the, it's uh, something they constantly keep up to date, but it's, these are all the frameworks that were tested builds against, and this is, uh, with every HHVM release, did their test coverage go up or down, and hopefully it keeps going up. Um. Uh, but the goal is obviously to get, um, make sure that all these core framework test suites pass with HHVM as, as they do with uh, they Well, I'm done with a bunch of old legacy crap, so I, you know, I, I Well, in your case, you'd be running, if, hopefully if you have a unit test or something, but running your test, nope. okay. <laughs> I probably would not recommend <laughs> just No, 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 I mean, I, I put it on dev server, but I just spin up a digital ocean box and put it there and see what happens. Yeah, like, and maybe have a Q18 have a go at it and see if they can. Yeah, yeah, I'd make Q18. Good question. Uh, quick question, uh, do you, I was looking at HHS for a while ago, and it didn't support like ion cube or uh, like other code obfuscator type thing. Do you know what uh, HHS What is ion cube? It, it's a code encryptor, basically. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for PHP? It's 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 so that you can hand out code and they can't really do anything with it. So if, like, if you're releasing commercial PHP software and you... Okay. Right. Uh, I would reason to say that might be something that takes advantage of quirks in PHP that they might not have modeled. Um, yeah, I would, uh, I, I met if since that would be valid PHP code, I expect that they would still like to run that. Uh, yeah, so they are running the extension, the PHP extension. Oh, it's a, it's a PHP extension? Yeah. Oh, okay. to interpret the, the Okay. Code. Oh, so that is probably definitely not supported. So the, um, they prioritize porting a lot of the standard PHP extensions like PDO and, and these things over. Uh, and then a lot of community extensions like a, like our, our MongoDB extension, we did not properly port that over to HHVM. They were kind of working on a compatibility layer so that theoretically you can run old Zend API extensions in HHVM. Um, but ultimately, the, the good course of action is that extensions be, should be rewritten for HHVM. Uh, so if that maybe the, the person uh, or the organization behind I, I am cute. Yeah. Might um, like which say would, but if HHVM is becoming a big enough market share for them to decide to, to port over to it. Because they probably have their own C API, it shouldn't be much glue between the PHP API. Okay. Uh, so look at hack. Uh, the first clue that this is slightly different from PHP is that hack files start with uh, question mark HH instead of PHP. Uh, and this is going to tell the HHVM interpreter that we're uh, to look out for different syntax. And so your traditional PHP files will get parsed and executed as PHP. And things with hack will be uh, that start with this would, would be parsed into hack mode. Uh, so in a nutshell, what is hack uh, going to give us? Uh, primarily static type analysis, uh, and this is something that will be coming to PHP 7 in the form of like static type hints. Uh, there are going to be there's certainly differences between the two, but one of the interesting overlaps is that a lot of the if you've been watching like a lot of the features upcoming in PHP 7 and some of the drama over RFCs and stuff in uh, the internals community and on the PHP wiki. A lot of the RFCs are being based on features uh, that are that we're showing up in Hack. Uh, and so the, in some cases, the, there's slight differences. The syntax isn't always the same. Uh, but it's kind of a, a blessing going forward that a lot of these features aren't just um, going to be stuck in Hackland, that we will get to use them as PHP developers as well. Uh, and so in static type analysis, this is um, the trickiness that they want to, they don't want to impose um, they don't want to remove the dynamicness of a PHP, but at the same time, uh, they, like if you're writing a function or you're writing code that um, expects to take a string and um, or expects to take an integer and the and user passes in a mixed value, um, one of those PHP statuses is the interesting ways that values cast between things. So the different ways that strings might get turned into integers and vice versa. Uh, so this lets you, if you're if you would like to be strict about uh, the types that your services or your code takes, 
uh, to actually have that enforced at the language level. Uh, and this uh, facilitates a tight feedback loop. HH server and HH client are two kind of tools that uh, ship with uh, HHVM. And uh, HH server kind of just watches your project directory and is doing uh, kind of like PHP lint might do in your editor and kind of does all the constantly just like checking your files. And a client is something that you would then set up with your um, maybe like sublime text or your ID to relay the feedback and give you say that there is an actual error. So a server uh, just watches the code and watches your files for changing and does the type analysis and client basically just continually will just query the server and says, is this file valid? Tell me about the, the, the maybe the syntax errors preemptively. Uh, so this is a good way to get a type feedback loop on if you're using uh, types for things. Uh, the benefit here is that you can check this before runtime. Uh, there, there will be some uh, in some cases, you might get type errors um, uh, at runtime if you're not using, but if, you, it, but sorry, but if your code is using uh, type hitting all over the place, uh, these are all errors that you should be able to check at runtime. That's one of also the selling points of in PHP 7 if we have static types. The IDE should be able to do all the code intelligence and know that, well, we're always getting a string here. If we're passing the wrong value, we can know that before we run the PHP code. Uh, so additionally, uh, there's going to be some new language features, which we'll uh, spend about a slide or two on, on uh, the important ones that I thought. Uh, some PHP features, uh, or quirks in that case, are basically removed, uh, some odd ways that PHP works. Um, a lot of that is covered in the hack documentation um, of some of the edge cases that hopefully people weren't depending on PHP anyway. Uh, and the, anyway, the goal of all this, uh, especially with some of the language features and the static types, is to be able to uh, spend less time uh, adding all the boilerplate for writing defensive PHP code and writing clean PHP code, and uh, be able to catch the bugs a lot earlier in the development cycle. Uh, so this takes us to the wonderful world of type hitting. Uh, and so in Hack, uh, and very much similar to what we're going to see in PHP 7, uh, you have your familiar scalar types, uh, none just being a, um, a union of uh, either an int or a float type. Uh, so those are the, the basic scalars and array elements. Um, you might say that I have an array of integers. Um, so this is kind of borrowing the syntax from like Java generics. Um, so we can say it's, it's an array of type T, and then T can be any other type. There might be other arrays. It might be a, a scalar. Uh, in this case, uh, if we want to include a key, so in this case, it's really the array is an associative array. Uh, it's an array where all the, the keys are expected to be strings, and they, they map to integers. And these types can also be used um, interchangeably with like class names, um, which is really the only typing we have in, or the only type that we have in PHP 5 today. Uh, but we can also do this on both class properties, return types, uh, which is also coming to PHP 7, and uh, arguments for methods and functions. Uh, we have uh, mixed, uh, which if you've written PHP doc before, that basically means uh, don't enforce this type, it should just be any, I'll accept any type. Uh, as well as things that are nullable. So accept the null value. Right? So this, this value either has to be a string or it can be null, but it can't be anything else. Uh, and the benefit of supporting this generic syntax is then we can write maybe cl uh, classes if you have a, let's say, a logger class that, um, or a, a collection class. You like a collection of type T, so you can use it with any of your other classes. This is a collection of users, a collection of address objects, a collection of uh, normal integers, etc. Uh, so the being able to support this kind of syntax and hack lets us write uh, one class instead of having uh, multiple copy copy pasted classes with uh, different type bits. And so just an example of what the syntax looks like, I won't dwell too much on this, but really indistinguishable from class type bits. And similar to uh, PHP 7, the return type going after the, uh, the function name before the brace. And so the benefit here, um, there's a um, Sorry. In, in this case, uh, you would get a warning up front if you tried to call the add method and passed in a non-integer value. Uh, constructor arc promotion is another little, just a nifty freebie they threw in there. Uh, a lot of times all the constructor does is take arguments and assign them to properties. Uh, so in this case, if we add in private to the argument, uh, kind of hack will just do that for us. So this is really synonymous with uh, this, just saving us some typing. And probably the chance to make a typo, because you be copy pasting the same variable name twice, et cetera. Uh, with generics, so this is an example of a, a service that adds two things together. So I might have a, in all likelihood, I'll only have an adder for floats and maybe another one for ints. Uh, but at the time I construct it, um, I define the class with the generic type. And then when I decide to use it, I would say it's a new adder of type uh, in, or a new adder of maybe some other numeric type. 
so this would complain to me if I uh, decided to, um, again, wh however I construct it with whatever value that is, that means that the add method only accepts the same type. Uh, so basically, inside the class, we'd be able to use the generic type um, just as if it was any other type. Uh, you can also do things like aliasing. So this is kind of doing like a type def in C. Uh, so this would be declared um, outside. This is, would be declared in like the top level scope uh, outside of your classes. Uh, type is really just a kind of like think of like a synonym. Uh, so anywhere I refer to it in, I can refer to my in. Uh, but new type is kind of like a type def in C where uh, if I'm using new type, that means that I can use my opaque type as a uh, as a type, but no, the code is not allowed to expect to know that it's an integer outside. So that's uh, truly in a C type def. Usually, your private header files might have uh, the actual structure, and then you'll just type def it as a, give it a fancy name. But you don't want the public API to know all the fields inside of your your structure, your class. You just expect them to work with your your alias. Uh, so that would be the difference between uh, type and, and new type here. Uh, so in this case, this is perfectly fine because internally the code is allowed to know that it is an integer, it's just a synonym. Uh, but in this case, there would be an error because I'm not supposed to know that it's an integer. I'm just supposed to recognize that it is this, this name to type. Uh, all this is quite configurable. So there's three different modes uh, for hack. Uh, there's dec uh, decal mode, uh, which is the most lax. Uh, there's uh, the default, which I believe is partial mode. And then strict mode is if you really want to go nuts, and, uh, not, and uh, not allow any untyped code to be called from your application. And so in a partial mode is the most flexible. This is gonna allow you to use typing where you want it, and also be able, it's flexible enough to be able to call it to untyped PHP code. <coughs> so the benefit here is that your hack project, uh, if you're working with legacy PHP code, you can start rewriting some of it in hack. And as long as your, your hack files are in partial mode, there's gonna be no problem if you decide to call legacy PHP functions. Um, so you can use hack and PHP interchangeably, obviously in separate files, but still have the, the application um, execute using both. And decal mode is useful if you're going to be, if you'd like to make the jump from strict code to, uh, uh, to legacy code. With decal mode, you're basically uh, restricting the type checking just to the, uh, the methods. You're using, like the body of all your methods, we're not going to apply type checking in there. Uh, so decal just named because we really care about method declarations. We're only going to check those types. Uh, so these are, uh, if you're just using, they're, they're basically declared at the top of your file with a comment. Uh, if you're following PHP 7, this was kind of one of the big things they were debating over, well, how do we let users opt into scalar type ends in PHP 7? Uh, and they settled on a slightly different syntax, but one of the ones proposed was the same way it would hack uh, previously had. Uh, something that I'm most excited uh, about hack code for, um, I've, uh, working with enough libraries and working with Doctrine or I'm an ODM, uh, the different ways that PHP arrays get abused. Uh, so in Hack, we have actual classes to uh, denote the different ways that we actually use arrays. There's a proper tuple type, uh, which is uh, tuples basically, if, if you've not worked with Python or other languages that have these, uh, basically a fixed length list of things. So there's no, um, it's not an array that might inadvertently turn into an associative array in PHP. Uh, a tuple, like, Best example here is probably a point. A point is always going to be like uh, two numeric values for a two-dimensional point, at least. Uh, or if you have a method that would like to return multiple values, uh, typically in PHP you might return an array of the first return value and the second return value. Uh, but in this case, we'd actually like to type to know that two things are coming back out of my method, a string and an integer. Uh, so a tuple is another a good use of that. Uh, so these are definitely quite useful as well as uh, shapes are basically uh, the concept of struct applied to PHP. Uh, so think about ways that maybe we use um, arrays as options uh, to pass options around in PHP. Uh, so I expect, uh, or um, in lieu of using a class name with public properties. In this case, uh, the shape is basically an array where the URL field is always going to be, it should always be a string. The count field should always be an integer. And then I can type in against this, uh, and I can return, a, return the shape. Uh, so kind of a step up from a tuple and then it has some associative keys attached to it. Uh, and then getting more exciting still, um, working with collections. Uh, so one of the largest problems I have with PHP is when you have arrays and you declare them, like a say, new array with one comma two comma three, and then you unset um, the middle element. Uh, say if you were to serialize a new array of one, two, and three to JSON, 
we turn into a JSON array. I don't think anyone would be surprised if it, if it didn't. Uh, but if we unset the middle value, they, all of a sudden the keys don't line up, and now it's a JSON object because the the one key is missing, and now we have it's basically a JSON object with zero to the first element and two to the the other element, and we're missing the middle one. Uh, so ideally, we'd like to say that this is an array that I really never care about the keys. It should just be a vector of, of elements. Or this is an array that is always an associative array. It should be considered a map. Uh, so with collections in Hack, uh, they have very specific classes that we can use for these. If you, and certainly, PHP arrays are still available. Uh, but they're, uh, not only are there classes, there's also literal syntax, which makes them much easier to use. Because uh, in PHP today, we could use uh, we could use classes for everything, but this uh, having literal syntax is very important. Uh, so, example of a vector: uh, a new vector of uh, list out four elements or remove a key, and then iterate over them. And the same thing in a PHP array. Uh, so, the difference I just mentioned in a, in a true vector: the fact that we remove the key doesn't really make a difference. It's still it's still a list of elements. Uh, but in a PHP array, all of a sudden it turns into a map, uh, which is kind of unfortunate if. You're doing JSON encoding, or in my case, if I'm writing a Mongo driver, I need to turn this into uh, an, ob an embedded object or an embedded array inside uh, MongoDB to be able to figure out what the PHP array is supposed to turn into. Uh, some other additional uh, features. I'll kind of uh, jump through these, but uh, things to explore if, uh, if you find them interesting. Uh, a more concise uh, syntax for closures. Uh, so PHP does have closures, but they're uh, kind of a, a bit different than normal closures in other languages. They don't inherit scope automatically. Uh, they're a little verbose if you're just using them as small callbacks. Uh, in Hack, uh, they came up with a more straightforward syntax for closures. So this is basically uh, ink equals and then everything after this. This is a closure that takes x and then returns x. So it basically, is in, think about an incrementing closure. Uh, and this gets uh, very useful when you're working with collections because then we can go from this uh, array filter, array map syntax. So kind of, if even when you want to do functional programming in, in PHP, the uh, default API is really making type a lot of code for it, so it becomes a lot less fun. Uh, but using the hacks uh, collections and closures combined, um, so the collections uh, kind of we use them instead of the array, so they could actually get a uh, So we can say a vector, we're going to map uh, every element of the vector to this closure. Uh, so I basically want to increment every element inside my vector. And then I want to filter and only get things back that are greater than 10. So again, basically two equivalent forms of code. The lower one is rewriting the PHP code in Hack. Uh, so hopefully this, I mean, it saves us on typing. It's a lot less code to read, uh, less verbose, and um, the benefit of also working with type checking and not having the edge cases of working with PHP arrays. Uh, continuations um, was something that uh, Hack ended up having before PHP 5.5 uh, introduced generators. Uh, so they basically, uh, in, in uh, HHVM and in PHP, they obviously support generators now. Uh, but in Hack, they have uh, things called continuations. Uh, quite similar to PHP generators, which are basically uh, functions that we can use as iterables in PHP, uh, if you've not used generators in any other language. Uh, so they're functions that, instead of returning, <coughs> they yield values. And when we iterate on them again, uh, the control flow picks back up inside where the function left off. and the will yield back to us the next uh, interval uh, So uh, for all intents and purposes, pretty um, identical to continuations that Hack offers us. Uh, and then more exciting, uh, the last feature I'm going to pull out is uh, async functions. And so has anyone worked with uh, C-sharp before? Uh, so in my understanding, I've not worked with C-sharp, but I've seen uh, or the, uh, the C-sharp Mongo driver and talk about developers there. I believe this is modeled after uh, C Sharp's uh, async await syntax. Uh, so this basically having functions in in your hack code, allowing a PHP function to be declared as async, and it returns a normal result of type awaitable, kind of it composes the result. Uh, and the awaitable means it's, it's something where the it's kind of a promise or a delay. Uh, we don't actually have the result of this function, uh, but at some point we're going to block and wait for it to to happen. So we declare the function as being asynchronous, and then asynchronous functions can then work with other async results, et cetera. And until somewhere further up the chain, we decide to actually uh, go back and join and access these, these values. Hopefully by then, the results are available to us. Uh, but meanwhile, until we decide to go block and get those values, the, the rest of the control flow can continue. 
Uh, so think of this as if you're doing uh, an API, you want to issue a bunch of HTTP requests, and you're going to use them all later. Um, you can just all fire them off, collect a bunch of async results, and then say, okay, now later on, I know I need now I need to read what the results are, and so I'll go block for them. And maybe you were doing other other activities, um, other CPU processing. In the background, HHVM was going and doing the web requests, and maybe by the time you need it, you don't have to wait at all. Uh, so this gives us it kind of uh, it doesn't require you to work with uh, callbacks or it doesn't expose the event loop like so it, it, it's async programming without looking anything like um, it still ends up looking quite procedural uh, or familiar like existing PHP code without uh, looking like a Node.js app basically. And so an example of this, um, an async function that generates responses, it might uh, create a list of a bunch of these uh, and call some other async methods. And then eventually we, uh, if you have multiple awaitables, we can combine them into a single handle, and then later uh, we can join on them. Uh, so originally Hack had support, um, I think it was Hack 3.6, so now there's, uh, sorry, HHVF 3.6 had support for uh, MySQL uh, async, which is probably the thing that everyone was waiting for, but they didn't have uh, fresh out of the gate. Uh, so previously they had the ability to do um, uh, async network IO and async uh, function calls, but there, there was missing async driver support for databases. Uh, so the, all of a sudden things are a lot more useful now and people can start paying attention to this. Uh, but if you're, this is still not the best documented thing, so it's um, something to look into uh, and probably be active in the IRC channel um, if you're curious about using it. Uh, some other interesting things, annotations, uh, which they call user attributes, uh, trait requirements, being able to say that this trait requires me to implement another interface. Uh, the override attribute saying that this method must be overridden in a, or this method cannot be overridden in a child. Uh, variadic arguments which are now in PHP uh, 5.6. I uh, ended up in Hack earlier. And uh, something to do with XML uh, which uh, I wouldn't consider using myself but uh, Facebook uses it internally. Uh, I'm going to breeze through extending HVM to if you have any questions on that you can come grab me after. Uh, but looking ahead what HTML and, uh, hacks and Facebook's involvement in this has given us, so in addition to the language spec, and uh, if we look at all the progress in the RFCs and what's going into PHP 7, uh, the, even though HHVM is separate, hack is separate, it's having a positive impact on uh, what we get to use and, and what we'll get to use in PHP 7. But definitely getting uh, kind of where PHP internals was maybe getting a little complacent or uh, too relaxed, now they've decided to pick up things to try and compete. Uh, having certainly multiple limitations of the language is a plus, giving us an actual specification and documenting these edge cases, and uh, ultimately having competition drives uh, more progress for these, these things. Uh, just a quick look at, uh, this is, uh, there's a website that kind of tracks all the packages on, uh, on uh, all the Composer PHP packages and see which ones are on Travis and which ones are um, tested against HVM, have some partial failures or are not tested against HVM. Uh, just to give some context, so last year, last year in April, there were about only 1,700 projects passing an HTTPM, and now there's uh, looks like 63,000. Uh, sorry, yeah, 6,300 of them. Uh, so it's definitely it doesn't take much to add HTTPM to your build matrix in Travis, and even if you want to allow failures on it, just to see if it's see if you're compatible with HTTPM, uh, it doesn't take much. Uh, and then additionally, things that are going to PHP 7, they're also adding a form of a JIT, um, not as Focus is what's in HHVM. LLVM is the technology they're using. It's a little more generic, uh, so I wouldn't expect the the same uh, performance or the same tailoring to hack code. Uh, that said, this is a lot of the refactoring that's going into PHP 7 and some of the, the speed ups from the, the first benchmarks they proposed uh, were over a year ago. Since then, uh, this is all on the PHP wiki, but uh, they've clo closing it on three times the speed as what they had uh, about 14 months ago or 15 months ago. And the other metric that they're tracking in their benchmarks is uh, when they're JIT compiling things, how many instructions are we getting it down to? So to give an idea, uh, their benchmark for WordPress goes from, uh, it was 9.4 billion instructions in January 2014, and now they've got it down to 2.4 billion uh, machine code instructions. So that's pretty good. Uh, and their speed up for a, a large WordPress app, they basically cut the time in half for their benchmark right from 24 seconds to 11 seconds. Uh, so that's, they're just using that to monitor their performance. Um, obviously, uh, the only benchmark that matters is your own application. Uh, so take any benchmark with a grain of salt. Um, uh, with that said, I will uh, cut it off now uh, to keep anyone here after 5 o'clock. 
Uh, if there's any feedback, uh, feel free to leave this. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, Mongo, I'll be back tomorrow morning uh, for two workshops. Uh, here's some other links, and I'll throw the slides up on the join in link as well later. There's a, there's a bit to add, link to the slides as well. So thank you, and uh, have a good afternoon.